Hello and welcome to another edition in our special series of CIB in Conversation, speaking to the keynote speakers for World Building Congress 2022, which of course is in Melbourne, Australia, uh, in late June 2022. Um, I'd straight away like to thank our sponsors for the Congress and for this series of conversations, and, and they're on the screen now. Today I'm really pleased to welcome, welcome Paul Kartoivels. Uh, he's the Executive Director for Brieg. Europe, but he's speaking today and, and at the World Building Congress uh, in his capacity as president of the European Construction Technology Platform. And we'll talk about that, uh, we'll, we'll get into that in a minute. Paul, uh, good afternoon to you there in, in, in Paris. Yes, in Brussels. Good in afternoon. Brussels, I beg your pardon. I, that's Brussels on your back background. <laughs> yes, good afternoon, Don. We say good afternoon. I don't know when the people will see it. But uh, yes, I'm here in Brussels and you have the European Parliament in the background. I think it's a good uh, image for all of you who look at us uh, because it's representative of the people of the European Union. So I think it's and it's a beautiful building also. So I thought it was a good idea to use this. So good afternoon to you all. Good afternoon. And, and of course, there's a Brussels important European Union connection with the ECTP role that you have. But um, but let's start just by talking a little bit about your background. Paul, how did you get where you are? What brought you into the construction sector and and, 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 and what's your career looked like to date? Um, so basically, I'm right now, as you said, the executive director for uh, Bouygues. The Bouygues Group is a large French company, mainly active in construction, but also telecom and, and television worldwide. And um, I've been in this office for almost 20 years now. And, uh, and uh, ECTP was created in 2004. So that structure is almost, is all, almost 20 years old, of course. And uh, if you really want to know about more about my background behind that, I am a bioengineer by background. And I started my career in the late uh, 80s by working first at the European Commission uh, in Belgium and in Canada, then for the United Nations in Africa, uh, and then at the European Parliament uh, in Brussels before uh, turning private and staying with Buig, uh, this uh, really interesting large company, very diversified uh, company. Fascinating. And how important has research been to you and 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 to the in the in the development of your of your career? Basically, you have to know that um, when we created ECTP uh, in 2004 with other partners, we were considering that the problem is very often research in construction is linked to the work sites. There is a lot of things that are being done live in a certain way. And uh, um, our thinking at that time was to say, okay, we have means, but not that large means to do research in construction. So we proposed the commission to support more the construction sector um, because at the other, the other way around, they were saying construction is very important in terms of you know, climate impact, CO2 emissions and all those things. So in a way, people were pointing the finger at construction for waste, for CO2, for many things, but there was not much effort done to support uh, research in construction. So basically that was really a long time work to make sure that we could have uh, guarantees that part of the money spent by the Europe on research would go to construction on a regular basis. The idea was let's make sure that there are calls for proposals every year in the construction sector. And so this is why uh, ECTP, the European Construction Technology Platform has been a partner of the commission for all those years on deciding together which would be the subjects to work on in terms of research. And uh, how, how would you describe the effectiveness then of the ECTP? Do you, you know, uh, is research funding in a better place now than it was, uh, what, 18 years ago? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely also because um, what we did actually, we focused in the beginning on energy efficiency in buildings. So that was really the hot subject. And so we focused on that. Uh, we had two times uh, find, uh, funding from uh, the European Commission between 2010 and 2000. Um, 17, 18, and then now we have new new fundings until 2027. So the continuity is there. So that is already a success. The difference now is that we have broadened the scope to other subjects than purely energy efficiency in buildings. And as you know, it's subjects that are dear to all of us, digitalization, greening of the buildings, of course, more participation of the, the, the people in, in the projects and in 
the you know the rethinking of the city so definitely we think it's a long-term relationship that has been evolving and the continuity is the proof that it's a success very very good and um so so let's come on to the subject of your keynote presentation because obviously it's going it's going to connect to that what's the title paul yes i wanted to propose the following title which is scientific excellence for urban regeneration and uh, the reason uh, why I chose this title, first of all, I, I thought I was going to say technological excellence, then I realized there is not only technology. So this is why I chose scientific excellence to make sure that we have technological sciences, biological science, social sciences, yeah. economics also, all those different values have to be taken into consideration. And the for urban regeneration is there to mean that all the research we're working on all together it's not the final objective. I mean, all this has to be many tools for urban regeneration, which means quality of life of the people. This is the reason why I propose this scientific excellence for urban regeneration. So uh, quality of life is obviously uh, of, of our people. Um, is, is, is sort of the main objective. How, how, and and, and uh, what, what are some of the key points that you think you'll want to bring out around this theme of scientific excellence? Yes. Well, to, to tell you the truth, we cannot just stick to this quality of life. We also have to stick to the global policies that are applied to Europe and to the planet. So basically, we have to find the right balance between following um, all the objectives that were defined by the Commission. And these are many, actually, so it's yeah. quite complicated. Um, to tell you the truth, everybody knows about the CO2 objective, which is called here climate change mitigation. I don't know if it's an expression that is used also worldwide, probably this is the CO2, or at least greenhouse gas effect to be really precise. But the Commission also talks about climate change adaptation as one of the key uh, objectives. These are the two climate objectives. And then they bring forward four environmental objectives, which are uh, the water management, the circular economy principles, the management of pollution and biodiversity. So this is to show you that uh, the commission is not only looking at uh, uh, greenhouse gas, but at all those objectives. It is very ambitious. It is very correct. I think it's a good choice of objectives, but you can imagine it's extremely complicated to bring all that uh, in the same uh, project. Although all the, all the words I mentioned to you right now are I think familiar to the construction sector. A lot of us have been working on one or another subject. The challenge now is to bring them all together and still make sure that uh, we make it affordable <laughs> to be developed for, uh, for the citizens benefit, of course. And as a partner of uh, the European Commission, the ECTP's membership, the makeup is, um, is, is industry, uh, senior industry practitioners from across Europe. Is that right? Um, we are about 400, uh, 140 members, sorry, in ECTP, and it comes from enterprises like large companies, smaller companies, uh, research organizations, universities. And in the companies, you have construction companies, but you have also material producing companies. So I would say it's all stakeholders from the real world in the construction <laughs> sector all together. Voila, that's the... Excellent. Well, and including universities from the real world, that's, yes. that's, that's good to yes. hear. Oh, yes, um, it's important. Yeah. Uh, and I know one of your major uh, messages has always been to connect researchers and practitioners better, you know, to... to yes. visit facilitate collaboration uh, you know uh, what 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 sort of progress do you think there's been in that respect and and and, and what are the next steps around that theme um first of all uh you know there, there is this discussion about uh, trls uh, technology readiness levels and uh, on those subjects uh, one of the main arguments with the commission since the beginning was to make sure that uh, money would go also or mainly to projects that are at higher TRL levels, so closer to the market. I think this is uh, one uh, really important thing. And, and also, I always say that the construction sector is the perfect sector uh, in the economy to talk about common sense. You know, we, we need to bring in this common sense of things that have to be feasible, that have to be solid, that, that have to last. And so uh, we need to bring this common sense into the discussion and that's what we have been done for some years now. 
to the point that now we are happy because the commission is talking about construction all over the place. There is a renovation wave in the Green Deal. Construction is really one of the main subjects. There is even a personal initiative from the president of the commission called the, the Bauhaus, the new Bauhaus initiative, which brings in not only this efficiency, but also the beauty, the beauty of the city, the beauty of the construction, the architectural side, which is also an element of the quality of life of the citizens, of course. If you have a very efficient city, which is not pleasant, uh, this is not good either. You have to be happy and proud and comfortable uh, yeah. where you live. So basically, yes, I, I think we, we are into a good, uh, good way to go. Um, my only worry is that, because we are talking here together with the research people, my only worry is the extremely heavy uh, regulatory environment that is being built up for the moment uh, with the argument of the climate change, of course, which is an excellent argument. Nobody uh, can deny this. The problem is that, you know, uh, too much regulation can become also a problem. So we have to make sure that we find the right balance between um, a regulatory framework that pushes toward integrating innovation and a regulatory framework that becomes so heavy that uh, people get discouraged. So that's a new challenge for now. Uh, it is this regulatory uh, consideration and have the research people talk maybe more to their fellows uh, in the law directorate of the company or accounting of the company. You have to make bridges, build strange bridges also within the company to make sure that research is fit for the regulation. Regulation is becoming so ambitious that if you do not follow it, your research program is not ambitious enough anymore. Right. So, so these connections are the complication of the moment, according to, to me, at least. So do you think research is keeping up in terms of providing the evidence base that you need for, 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 for you know, regulatory progress? Um, I think we are giving the right messages. I think we are giving all the best messages that we can. Uh, I don't know whether we are listening, listened to as much as we could. Yeah. Um, because, you know, again, uh, the, the things that we have, we have to talk with the civil servants who prepare those documents. We have to talk to politicians because politicians like to make declarations and they make very ambitious declarations, but we are the ones who have to enact it behind. So yeah. it's really it's really complicated. Um, so yes, I would be a bit worried for the moment that uh, our messages are really heard. Um, as I said, uh, too much ambition kills ambition and uh, we should make sure that people remain enthusiastic about all the things we can do. Um, but it is, I tell you, it's really complicated. The, the, the big discussion here in Brussels is really on not too much regulation. I will give you one example, very concrete example for construction. Um, people want to have more and more recycled products integrated in construction, which is a good point. We all want to do that. But if, if you stick to too high levels of uh, recycled or reused products, where are those products? Are they available? At what price? At what quality? So basically, if you put a regulation on the numbers in 30%, 50%, but behind the market of those products do, does not exist yet, no matter how, how good research you have done or whatever, uh, you have to make sure that uh, things are feasible. That's a real constraint for the moment to have research, rational people, developers, and regulatory people uh, work together to make uh, plans that can work and work fast because the climate objectives are urgent. So we need to make sure, you know, sometimes the timing of research is very long. Now we need to also do things uh, uh, as fast as possible in a way, which is also an ambition in itself. So you're describing a classic value of collaboration between regulators, uh, industry and the market and, um, and the research uh, world. And uh, I think actually a number of our keynote speakers touch on, on that, so that sort of uh, theme, Paul. So you won't be alone uh, in, in, in highlighting that sort of issue. Um, if, if, if I may just ask you one final question about ECTP's agenda, clearly its primary focus is on uh, the European Union. Um, but to what extent do you take a perspective looking at uh, uh, the rest of the world and, uh, for example, developing countries? Yes, you are taking the words out of my mouth because as, as I lived myself in Africa, I am totally connected also to emerging countries, developing countries, and definitely it's an extremely important argument uh, for the simple reason that, you know, 
the Congress will be a worldwide Congress. Yes. And, and the challenges of today are worldwide challenges. So it doesn't mean that we have a unique worldwide solution, but we need to work on worldwide solutions adapted to every continent, every country, every climate situation, economic situation, etc. And it is true that we, we must think clearly that improving by a small margin uh, impact on environment in Europe uh, is nothing compared to you know, emerging countries that will have an urbanization process that will be really fast, really large, and we need to help these people to do that properly also. So this is also why when I told you we need to have feasible things, realistic things, it's important that those um, emerging countries can take advantage of whatever we do to apply it in their very rapid uh, urban development, because otherwise all the efforts that you do in Europe would be totally uh, dwarfed by what is happening worldwide. So mm. definitely I, I can tell you that uh, to me, um, what happens in those countries is really important. Uh, not too long ago, I even um, uh, warned the European Investment Bank uh, by telling them that being too ambitious on regulatory aspects for those countries was probably not the best idea. We need to be pragmatic. So, so basically going simple and practical is important so that more people can apply it. Otherwise it's gonna be terrible. So yes to total support to the other parts of the world. And, and um, did you have any involvement in COP26, Paul, or do you get involved in the Congress of the Parties? Mm -hmm. I just wondered to what extent you think that um, the United Nations agenda is recognising what you're saying there and uh, whether you think that policies are aligned at the UN yes. level in, in, a, in, in, a, in, a, in the most helpful way. Yes. You will say that I'm everywhere because when I was in Africa, I was there for the United Nations also. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 basically, right now in in those large events, no, I do not participate for the simple reason that I don't have the time. The time with all the work I have to do here. So the best the best they can do, uh, I'm I'm really happy. I would love to participate, but it's I'm I'm not telling you how many things I cannot do because uh, it's just. Yeah. You know, we, we, we are who we are and we need to rest uh, sometimes. Uh, but again, um, I would say that the weaknesses of those big machines are the fact that you need to find global agreements between uh, many countries. And uh, personally, for having worked in, in Africa myself, but really in the bush, I can tell you that you must start by simple things. You must start by cheap things. And to me, you can have all the ambitious worldwide uh, um, numbers that you want to reach my point and that is valid for any country in the world is what can we still already do which is fast and cheap or even free so if we really want the built environment to be lower impact there are a lot of things that can be done with uh, inspiration ideas quick things and that's also the kind of things we have to share you know uh, innovation uh, does not mean not necessarily lab research. It can be great ideas. Also, I would say, let's take a look backwards, past solutions, how people were building before the oil times or the electricity times. There are solutions that are also there that we can reuse now. So um, yes to the big ceremonies, that's great. But I'm happy to when people say that, uh, okay, there was this solution applied in buildings that one stage we can reuse them now um, my criteria being when i pull the plug what is still working you know yeah. and so and so basically on a building you can also decide when you pull the plug uh, how cool or or warm or how much light goes in it because you have been thinking hard about the architecture the bioclimatic architecture the choice of the materials all those things are also really important before you digitalize well, Paul, I've really enjoyed uh, listening to you, and uh, I know that our delegates in um, in Melbourne are going are going to love your presentation, and I hope they get an opportunity to interact with you in the question and answers and discussion and so forth. Um, before we finish, um, I'd just like to ask you a final question, which is really about your your key message, a sort of final point that you'd like to get across to researchers around, you know, what the the, the top opportunity or the top challenge. That researchers ought to take away from your from your keynote. You know, 
in the in the built environment, there is one major challenge, which is recognized also by by Europe. It's the the renovation of buildings, retrofitting of buildings. So it's a good point. Uh, the thing is that it's not an easy point. It's not an yeah. easy point because uh, you know buildings are many. <laughs> you you cannot always do uh, more buildings in in one time unless it's a whole district with the same architecture or whatever. So I think uh, research can do a lot of good work on on uh, answering to all those challenges of retrofitting with uh, solutions that are good for all the objectives that I mentioned to you before on climate and environment. That, that is really quite classy. There is a word that um, one of my teachers at, at university used often on, on what they were doing in research. And it was, it was say, we have to find elegant solutions. Ah, yes. Elegance yes. of the solution. I really love that word in research because it means that you find something classy, which is inspired, which is integrated. So we need to find elegant solutions to make uh, the retrofitting as rapid, as economically acceptable as possible, as beautiful as possible, and uh, low environmental impact, of course, uh, that's the, the main things. So if I had to concentrate on one thing, I would say this, this retrofitting, this renovation challenge is huge, and there is a lot of work to do to make it uh, wider and faster as possible well that's a great place to finish thank you but thank you very much indeed um and uh, i'm sure we'll debate uh the issue about retrofit uh in much more detail at the world building congress um so thank you paul thank you very much in brussels thank you very much indeed for your time this afternoon and thank you very much Thank, thank you very much, Don, and thanks to all of uh, you who listened to the DSX exchange. Thank you. We, we, we look forward to seeing you in um, and uh, all our keynote speakers and all our delegates and all our sponsors uh, in Melbourne uh, in late June at the World Building Congress. Thank you very much indeed for, to, for watching today's edition. And, and for now, goodbye. Goodbye.